Good morning, everybody. Welcome here to Pineville Christian Church. It's glad to see everybody this morning. Um, it's, it's good just to get together and sing as, as God's children. And if you would, let's just uh, stand together and sing and, and lift our voices to him. I serve a risen Savior, he's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy, I hear his voice of cheer. And just in time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. In all the world around me, I see his loving weary, I never will despair. I know that he is leading through all the stormy blasts. The day of his appearing will come at last. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. Salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Rejoice, rejoice, O Christian. Lift up your voice and sing. Eternal hallelujahs to Jesus Christ the King. The hope of all who seek him, the help of all who find. None other is so loving, so good and kind. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to him. not i hope you're making some preparations and some thoughts and some plans on how he can become a part of what's going on in your heart but most of you if not all of you in a congregation today are believers in the lord jesus christ and so we are thankful that you chose to be a part of today's worship service with us if you're joining us online we're glad to have you of course if you're visiting we always say this uh look we're especially glad that you chose to be here today and hope that that your time with us is something that's meaningful in your uh, week and in your journey with, with the Lord. If you're a first-time visitor, there should be a little card there in the front of one of the uh, seats there. Fill that out, put it in the offering plate a little bit later, and let us have a record of your visit so that we'll know that you were here and we can you know, just get you on um, the, the list to get some information if you'd like it. Certainly, it's not to try to badger you or anything like that, but just to kind of to make you aware of uh, what might be going on and how it might apply to you. You know, as we think about uh, worship today, we, we always you know, do a number of things. Um, we pray, and we're going to do that in just a second, but we, we also have some announcements and share some different things, and a lot of times we do that at the end, but I did want to make, a, make you aware of a few things. Uh, this afternoon, right after church, uh, Todd will be having a little quick meeting with those who are volunteering and serving in the children's ministry. If you're on that list, then you should have received that, but if you didn't, or if you're thinking hey, you know what, I might be able to participate in some way to help out with, um, you know, we use the term volunteer because that's obviously it's non-paid, but, but it's not a volunteer in the sense like it's just some organization out there. We're, 
we're serving Christ whenever we uh, teach children and work together. So if you could uh, be here for just a few minutes, you know, Todd takes, he takes pride in his, his meetings, being quick and all that kind of stuff. So I'm sure he'll have us an agenda and we'll be ready. So I uh, look forward to seeing you down there for that. A couple other things. Um, do want to ask you to remember those um, who are in special need of prayer. I want to continue to lift up Miss Sandy um, and all that she's going through. Some others that are sick and going through some difficult times, and you may, may know of someone. And look, this is the life that we lead, you know, in a broken world um, where we have challenges. And um, I was speaking with a man yesterday and got a, uh, his stepdaughter, 32 years old, going through uh, colon cancer and having all sorts of problems. Asked for prayer. Uh, didn't want to mention it by name, but asked for prayer. So I'm sure there are others that may be. Uh, in situations like that, maybe we can continue to lift them up, and you know, because it's, it's hard. You know, I know every week people have difficult things they're facing, and so we want to pray that God would help them through that. And of course, sometimes during the weeks we have uh, good things happen. Last week uh, we had, uh, or was the first, first of this week, right? Tell us what happened with uh, with you, Victory, of, of something that I think is noteworthy and worth sharing. What didn't something significant happen to you this week? What happened? Yes, sir. So I um, had the conclusion of my doctoral program, and I am officially a doctor of education. So, good for you. Absolutely. So fantastic uh, to want to recognize her. For those of you who don't know, I think she, she's the dean of education over at LCU. And um, you know, this is a milestone. I mean, how many years have you been working on this? Three years. Three, Three years. years. On top of your master's work and on top of your other things. And so I, I like to share that. Number one is just, you know, we applaud you and champion you in that success. But also as a reminder, boys and girls, you know, to accomplish things in life, it takes a little while. Whatever you set out to do, you got to stick to it. Don't be so caught up in just jumping onto one thing there. The things that are most meaningful in life generally take time to develop, and you got to work through them. And I'm sure there were many times whenever – with a job, with kids, with a husband. Everybody was frustrated. I'm Tony trying to figure out how we're going to do all. Oh, no, shh, okay, don't say that. <laughs> yeah, so, so Tony has got a prayer of blessing. You know, can you imagine, I mean, three years of a full-time job, full-time mom, full-time wife working towards that, just like many of you have done in different ways. But guess what? You persevere, and you keep pressing on, and if you stay the course, guess what happens? You get to the other side with a measure of success. And that's something that we need to tell people. Too often our, our Christianity and our religion is, is so watered down. It's not the real stuff of life that, hey, being a Christian is hard. Living for God is hard. Being the person who follows through is hard. Being a person who does what's right whenever it's easy to do what's wrong is hard. And you got to do it. you got to stick to it. And I hope that, that testimonies like that and so many others are inspirations to us as we endeavor to achieve things in our Christian life and in our life together. So great job. Look forward to that. One quick announcement, kind of not related to that, but Victory is actually going to be leading tonight uh, in a little kind of multi-church uh, night of worship. If you like contemporary worship, um, you know, with contemporary music, some of like the things we do, but I'm sure it'll even be a little bit more. I'm sure they'll probably have lights and all sorts of things down at the River Outreach Center this evening at 6 o'clock. Um, I happen to know um, their pastor, Coach Dennis Dunn, and a number of folks who go there. I actually go myself. I do enjoy that. Um, so if you are interested in that tonight at 6 o'clock down at River Outreach Center, I want to invite you there. Victory is going to be one of the singers, one of the leaders. So, uh, And it's, I think, worship leaders and singers from five different local churches. So just an opportunity, if that's something that, that would be inspirational to you, invite you to be a part of that as well. Look, in this life, we're all trying to figure out how, if we're sincere to be the kind of person God wants us to be. And some days we're tracking on it better than others. Some weeks we're tracking on it better than others. But hopefully that in this next few moments, this will be an opportunity for each of us to say, okay, hey, God, let me kind of put aside all the struggles that I'm going through and just think about you for a moment. Would you help me? Maybe I'm doing great. And so then you say especially, hey, can you help someone else? And in this process, we're going to all hopefully hear from him in a way that's meaningful. And I invite you to join me in that process this morning. Let's bow together and lead us in a congregational prayer. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that you do live within our hearts. Lord, our hearts sometimes are so dark and so wicked and so self-serving and so selfish. But when you come into our hearts, you allow us to open them up to be 
so much better and to live a life that is so much more meaningful. And so we're grateful. Lord, we're grateful for all the blessings, the successes, and the victories that we have in our life. Lord, we do confess that we are sad when we see our friends and family struggling. Lord, when we see those who are very sick and in pain, we pray, Lord, that you would comfort them. Lord, when we think about those who have lost loved ones and grief is difficult to bear, we pray that your spirit would give them comfort. Lord, for those who are battling poor thoughts, emotional baggage, struggles, Lord, I pray that they would look to you for the strength to carry on and to move beyond these moments of difficulty. Lord, as we continue in this few moments together, I pray that our songs, our prayers would all be sincere, offered to you, our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Why don't you stand with us as we continue to sing together.
the first. I am desperate. Immerse me. I'm not waiting. Not anymore. I need you, Lord. I need you, Lord. Cause there's a hunger and a thirst. that matters Lord God you're the only one the only thing Lord we need you God I need you I need you Lord I need you Lord I need you Lord I need you Lord I need you Forgive 
sure there's gonna be some fantastic music over there tonight and there I've heard some fantastic singers in my life but can you imagine what it's gonna be like when all of the greatest voices that have ever lived and the greatest musicians who've ever lived and possibly the greatest dancers and the greatest most talented people who have ever existed join with the angels and all of creation apart from all the brokenness of this world and that service as the, the voices and that experience erupts, it's going to be unbelievable. Man, I cannot wait to get there. And listen, the reason that I'm there, I'm there, I'm going. But I couldn't get there on my own. So that first song talked about how we need God and we need Jesus. And I want you to understand today as we think about communion, Listen, you can't get there. You'll never get to that service. You'll never get to heaven. You'll never get to everlasting life on your own because there's nothing you can do. There was only one person, one man, one man who could do it that got on the cross, 
So you, could, you couldn't get up there and do it because you're a liar. You're a cheater. You're selfish. You're just like me. You're apathetic. And the greatest humans who ever lived all fall into that category. The Bible says what? Everyone is a sinner. All have fallen short of God's glory except for one. And guess what he did? He got on that cross, suffered, bled, and died so that every person could have a chance to get there, to come back into fellowship with God. Man, that's what Christianity is about. I know that, that in our expression of it and in the world's expression of it, it, it sometimes gets distorted. And we sometimes get it confused. And even in our best efforts, we kind of mess it up. But when we come together for communion, I hope that whether you're here, whether you're watching this, whether you're replaying it, that you will focus that the reality of Christianity is not all these other trappings and all the failures of the Christians of which you and I are. It's the exaltation of the Savior who came to us when we needed him and then let's embrace him. It's not a once fits all. It's the embracing of a life that starts when we confess, we repent, we're baptized, and we say, I need you, God. I need Jesus. And so many of you have done that so many in the world today have not. And I hope that as we take communion today and we talk in a moment about evangelism as the spread of the gospel, that each of us would reflect in a maybe a more intense way today upon how much you needed Jesus and then somehow, some way, recognize that others need him too. And you may very well be the most important part of the process that God uses for them to come into awareness of that need. Let's pray. The Father, as we think about... <clears throat> these very common elements, this unleavened bread and this juice, we pray that in these next few moments we would see the very uncommon, the very extraordinary sacrifice that they represent. May the remembrance of that sacrifice serve to inspire us to love you more, to serve you with a greater intensity. than maybe we have had in the past. We pray that you would use this time together. In Christ's name.
bring up our offering. Certainly, we invite you to participate in the offering as you uh, feel led. You'll notice up there a lot of the folks who are members here, um, which I guess I'll say that tongue-in-cheek. Mike always reminds me that we don't really technically have members, but when we're, if you're members of Christ's body and you worship here, a lot of the folks who are regular, um, they make their donations and they give online. And I uh, certainly appreciate that. We're able to do a lot of things. Um, they share often, and I, I like to repeat this because people don't, you know, we live in a transient world. People are gone a lot. That's just the nature of life now. And so I recognize that. We do post the quarterly, all of our expenditures that are right outside there. And I just want you to know, um, you know, in this world, people are in a right way concerned about how things are allocated because a lot of people are not, um, not trustworthy. And a lot of people do things that they shouldn't do. And we're not trying to throw stones at anybody because we know that oftentimes in our own life we don't do what we should do. But we, we want to have accountability and we want to have clarity. And have always from the very beginning um, in our congregation, you know, like to have total transparency about what we do and how we allocate the funds. And have always confessed that, that we don't always know exactly what we need to do with them. You know, we, we, that's part of why we gather together as leaders and we talk to people and we try to figure out, you know, but we're fully aware, as you are, that we are the wealthiest people that have ever lived in this world. Now, I know that we can point to some super wealthy people that have more money than I do, but when you really zoom out, every one of us in here are dressed nice. Most of us didn't go hungry. Some of us have eaten way too much. I mean, we go out to eat and we can drop a few hundred dollars. We have more than most people have ever had. And that's not, there's not, it's not wrong. That's just the world in which we live, right? And many of us have tried to be good stewards of everything God's given us. And as a result, he's blessed us. And so we, if you're like me, you try to figure out, hey, how do we do this? And all I like to share, and I don't think we can ever hear it enough because I, I need to hear it, is in this life, don't hold on to what you got. Holding on to it. Spending everything you have for your own entertainment, and for your own pleasure is a recipe for misery. And the sad reality is the recipe is like a cake that you won't know what happens until you get to the end. Trust me, when Jesus says, where your treasure is is where your heart is. And if your treasure is constantly giving, whether it's through the local church or through some other ministry or even what you're doing, give it away as much as you can, as often as you can, and as cheerfully as you can. And let me tell you what, you can't imagine how that comes back to you, not in money, even though sometimes, here's what's crazy, is the more you do that, the more it comes back to you because God knows you're going to be faithful with it and you continue to do it. And many of you have given testimony after testimony, and I have too. But that's not the reason. The reason is what? Is look, the best things in life happen when we give. And we pour out not just our resources in money, but in our time and our energy and our effort. And so, look, everything in this world that I see, especially in our culture, is saying get, get, get. Keep, keep, keep. Spin, spin, spin. Never forget. Jesus stands in stark contrast to that. He's saying give, give, give. Serve, serve, serve. Sacrifice. Decide how you're going to align your life. Because it'll determine, ultimately, the, where you end up. Let's pray. Father, as we take up these tithes and offerings, we surrender them to you. We pray, Lord, for wisdom and discernment on how best to allocate them. We ask you to multiply them for your kingdom's sake. We pray, Lord, for insights, not just as a collective group, but individually on how to serve you better with the resources that you've given us. Help us fight against the spirit of materialism and greed that so prevalent around us. Help us to serve you in this way. We thank you for the blessings that we do have and we pray for those who have not been as fortunate in this world.
girls. I don't know who's got, do you got Todd? Todd, Mr. Todd's got downstairs. So boys and girls, if y'all are ready to head downstairs. You know, you got to be careful who you, who you complain to sometimes. I mentioned uh, to Misty, I said, man, I said, I'm already 10 minutes behind. I was like, I'm going to have to preach her in a hurry or I'm going to be the one. She said, well, you're the one that did the t- talking so long before. So you got nobody to blame but yourself. The, uh, so she, she, wasn't, she wasn't wrong. So I'll try to speed it up a little bit to, uh, to get it going. Now, we're following along in the book of Acts. We're in chapter 16. If you have your Bible, we're going to pick up in verse 11. Now, if you've been here, then I know that you are completely up to speed. You're almost a Bible scholar now, right, uh, on where we are in the book of Acts. Some of you hadn't been here, but I'm certain. Um, you know, I didn't even ask because I know y'all have been following along, some of my folks that hadn't been here in a little bit. But if you hadn't been, you can always go back and check that out online. But just so I'm going to take a second. We're, we're at the point where Paul, remember a couple of weeks ago, Paul and Barnabas, they parted ways. And now we got two missionary teams, and we continue to follow the travels of Paul and Silas. Along the way, he picks up Timothy. And last week, we see that Luke joins them in this particular journey. And we talked last week because how they were going in different directions. They, they come across, and they keep going through Asia Minor. And we had the whole deal about north, south, east, but they end up pushing west. For some reason, the Holy Spirit reveals to them through a dream that they need to cross over into Macedonia. And so jump to the next slide for me, Brendan. We're going to see there this charts that missionary journey, the second one. And so this today we pick up is the first entry of official or recorded Christian ministry into the continent of Europe. Up until this point, all of the missionary activity had been limited to Asia Minor, okay, which is where they had done before. But at this point, they progress over and the, the, the message of Christ or Christianity starts spreading into Europe. Now, as we think about this text, I put the phrase in there, evangelism. That's a word that's not used as much anymore, but many of you who've been in church for a long time um, are familiar. The term evangelism is the official term for the, the spreading of the gospel. So, for instance, the, you know, it, it comes from some of the words about the evangelist is the one who's out there sharing the message of the gospel, okay? And so evangelism is that process. And part of our call as Christians, every one of us, is to evangelism. Now, we all have different gifts and different talents and different skills. We are in different places and different ages. But still, undergirding everything should be within us this desire to share the gospel with other people. Sometimes God calls people to specific things like Paul and Silas here. They are called to specifically go and evangelize in this particular place. We've supported missionaries in our church. If you see some of the pictures out there or downstairs, places where some of our missionary friends have felt called in a specific way to go to these particular places. Now, we can't all jump jump on a ship and go there with them, so what do we do? We offer them monetary support. We offer them prayer. We offer them encouragement. One of the ways we do that is every year um, we do the, the shoe boxes. Y'all don't have every year we have the shoe boxes. That's a form of evangelism. We partner with another organization that sends and they actually take those shoe boxes and they go into these places and share the gospel. Okay, so evangelism is this broad concept. And as we look at this today, these four or five verses, there's some observations that I want to make about evangelism that I think will apply to all of us. Why don't you stand with me as I read these four or five verses together from Acts. The writer says, We boarded a boat at Troas and sailed straight across to the island of Samothrace, and the next day we landed at Neapolis. From there we reached Philippi, a major city of that district of Macedonia and a Roman colony, and we stayed there several days. On the Sabbath we went a little way outside the city to a riverbank where we thought people would be meeting for prayer, and we sat down to speak with some women who gathered there. One of them was Lydia from Thyatira, a merchant of expensive purple cloth who worshipped God. As she listened to us, the Lord opened her heart, and she accepted what Paul was saying. She and her household were baptized, and she asked us to be her guests. If you agree that I am a true believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my home. And she urged us until we agreed. May God bless the public reading of his word. You may be seated. So we see here 
the first encounter that's recorded for us as Paul and Silas seek to evangelize into what is a somewhat different part of the Roman Empire. You see, when you crossed over that area into Europe, you became into what was more a part of the original Roman Empire. There was a lot more Roman influence. And so that's why you get the notation here of a Roman colony. It's, it's very much more governed in a different way than some of the outside regions. And so there's less and less Jewish influence and more and more Roman influence as they move into there. And so as we look at that, I want us to observe a few things. The first observation that I'd like us to look at today in relationship to evangelism that I think we can see that will help us and may apply to us as well is this. Number one, keep moving until you get where you're supposed to be. Now notice in the story that they crossed over from Troas. They went to the island of Samothrace. Then they went to Neapolis until they finally reached Philippi which was where they were supposed to be going. Now, undoubtedly, there were people in all of those other places that needed to hear the gospel. There were people of significance that were created by God, that God loved, that Jesus wanted to reach. But that wasn't where Paul and Silas were supposed to be. So what did they do? They kept moving until they got where they were supposed to be. I don't want to get you to miss this. Too many times we're trying to do things in places that we're not supposed to be. We don't have the insight to realize that, hey, I need to keep moving until I get where it is that God wants me to be. God had a plan for Paul and Silas in Philippi. And had they subverted the plan, it would have changed. Now, God in his sovereignty is somehow able, now this is what's wild to me, is he somehow able to sovereignly move all the pieces in all the directions to make it all happen how he wants. But at the end of the day, we have free will and we're choosing and we need to have the insight to realize that every place is not where we're necessarily supposed to be. Some places, literally, are just places we're passing through to get to where we're going. Now, that doesn't mean that they're no good or they're not meaningful, but we're to pass through them to get to where we're supposed to be. How many people, listen to this, I've met in my life, they can't get to where they're supposed to be because they're camped out in a place they just were meant to pass through. That could be relationships, that could be finances, that could be any number of things. Because guess what? Everywhere you go, there's an opportunity for comfort, for ease, but you got to keep going. you got to track to where it is that God wants you to go. And when it comes to evangelism, I think this applies because we can't be everywhere. We can't reach everyone. We can't do everything. But what we can do is the one thing that God wants us to do. Don't fall victim like I have many times in my life to trying to shotgun and shoot everything so much that you miss everything. Figure out what it is God wants you to do and where he wants you to go and then just keep moving until you get there. Number two, have a plan to reach people, but allow the plan to develop naturally. Now, I say this because I was raised in a time and in a place where the, the format for evangelism and reaching people was, was formal. I mean, it was planned out. I mean, they gave us a gospel tract. All right, they gave us a track, and I mean, as a student, they said, hey, you should go talk to so-and-so, and I mean, I want you to go with so-and-so's house, and we'd knock on the door, and you know, it, it was very planned out, but I didn't feel, and I'm just being honest, and I'm not saying God doesn't use anything, okay, because he does, but it never felt real natural to me to just do that, to just go up, knock on a door, or go up there to somebody on the street, and shape, you know, and just interject myself, that, that's not how I operate with people. All right? Now, if, if that is how you operate, well, then that's, that's what you do. But the point I want you to understand is that have a plan. Look what it says. They had a plan on the Sabbath. They went a little way outside of the city to a riverbank. Now, remember, previously every Sabbath, what did they do? They would go into the synagogue. But remember, now they've left the Jewish culture. There's not a lot of Jewish culture in this Roman province here. 
So there's not a synagogue. So what do they do? They improvise, and so what do they say? Okay, well, there's no synagogue for us to go talk to Jewish people to. So they, they identify a river bank. Listen, I like this phrase right here. Where we thought people would be meeting for prayer. We use their brain. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like, just because you become a Christian doesn't mean that you have to become an idiot, all right? And just label it as faith. I meet people all the time, and I, I say this with tremendous sincerity and in humility. Don't check your brain at the door to become a Christian. Now, embrace faith, but don't embrace stupidity. And many people are confused between faith and stupidity. And I know that's not the nicest word, but I don't know how to say it. I mean, I meet people who, who do dumb things, and they label it as faith. Now, I'm not saying that every now and again God doesn't call us to do something unorthodox. And certainly much of what we do is foolishness to the world. But I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about something that, that 10 of us as believers would hear and go, that's dumb. You know what I mean? All right, look, if the good people in your life, now I'm not talking about one or two. But if the good people in your life are all telling you this is not the right thing and it's a dumb thing, trust them. All right? Just trust them. But, so have a plan. They didn't, they didn't just randomly go. They thought about, man, you know what? I bet you there's going to be some people out here and they might be there for prayer. All right? They had a little strategy there. All right? But when they got there, notice what they did. They just kind of started talking to people. People were there praying. What did they go do? They go and they go to speak to some women who'd gathered there. So in our effort to, have a, to, to reach people, let's have a plan. But why don't we focus on allowing that to develop in a natural way as opposed to some of the folks who have a plan, but, but they're, not, they're not allowing it to develop in a natural way. So have you ever been to New Orleans and you run across some of these folks who are shouting um, screaming at everybody they're going to hell. You know, I don't feel that's very natural. I don't feel like it's super effective myself. Now, I, I, I'd be love to talk with someone if they disagree with me on that. And, and I certainly would say it's, a, it's an act of faith and, and people are, are performing a witness. But I wonder sometimes if maybe in a desire to really reach people in the city of New Orleans, instead of climbing up on a box and shouting about everybody who's going to hell, why don't you just go down there about 6 o'clock in the morning when everybody who's drunk still passed out and go down there and help them out and go down there and help them find where they need to go and talk to them a little bit about their problems. There, look, look, here's the thing. Too many people want to get up on a box and shout what they need to be doing or what really what everybody else needs to be doing instead of doing what we need to be doing. Have a plan, but let it develop naturally in whatever way you reach people. Some of you have asked me for prayer, and over the, my years, many people have concern for family members. What do I do? How do I reach them? Don't try to preach to them. Don't send them every sermon online. Don't do all that. Just talk to them. Tell them what God's done in your life. Now, look, make a plan, which is hard, right? That is hard. I, I 100 percent agree. I have friends of mine from periods in my life where the nature of our relationship wasn't exclusively spiritual, okay? And so, you know, sometimes whenever you start down a path in a relationship with someone, even though it might not necessarily be wrong, it, it becomes difficult to switch gears. I don't know if that makes sense, but so maybe your relationship was completely professional and it was always like this, but then you get the inclination Man, I should share with them a little bit about my faith. You know, I, I care for them in some sense, and I would like for them to know how I feel. And, and it, it's challenging. So you've got to think about it. You know, think about when does the Lord open up the opportunities for you to share with them. You know, sometimes, let me tell you some amazing little things that I've noticed, and this has been my experience, is oftentimes praying before you eat can become a way. You know, is, you know, you can very naturally say to someone, hey, look, can we pray and just thank God for all the things that he's given us? I know I hadn't done that in the past, but I'm trying to be more grateful in my life. 
And then you start praying. You start praying for them. And then whenever they tell you about something that's going on in their life that's difficult, hey, can I pray for you or can I put you on the prayer list at church? You see what I'm saying? you got to strategically plan to make those transitions, but do it in a natural way. Because if you really care about them, that's what you want. The end goal is for them to come to know Christ. It's not to get them to come here. It's not to get them a checklist. Hopefully it's not to make you feel better about yourself. It's for them to come to know the God who created them. In an effort to do that, number three, notice what they did. They found some common ground and they focused on those who were willing to listen. We're introduced here to Lydia. It says one of them was Lydia from Thyatira, a merchant of experience of purple cloth who worshipped God. See, she already had an inclination to be a worshiper of God. She didn't understand the true God. She didn't understand the revelation of the true God through Jesus. And so she was willing to listen. Friends, please, when you set out to speak with someone and talk to them about the gospel, try to find common ground. You don't want to start out like this. This is, I mean, how has that ever worked in anything? That doesn't work in any format of life. If you're trying to do business with people, those of you who have had any sort of sales training or some of you who've been in organizations with leadership training, what are you always trying to do if you want to have meaningful connection with folks? You're trying to find common ground. Realize where we are moving together, how we're working together. And once we find the common ground, we build on that. And I would say where it becomes very important in the gospel is focus your efforts on those who are willing to listen. If someone is unwilling to listen, don't waste a lot of time. Now, don't mean by that that they're not important or that it's not important. What I'm saying is you know as well as I do. In any relationship, if someone is constantly talking to you about something that you don't want to hear, what do you do? Now, don't, husbands, don't look over. Don't turn around. You know what you do. Like you do.